So I think it's long established now through uh, a series of three outlook reports, the most recent in 2009, that there are four major threats to the Great Barrier Reef, but clearly climate change is emerging as the most significant of those. Uh, and it seems like with every passing year, the impacts from climate change grow. And although we've spoken for some time of uh, at least six different categories of impact from climate and ocean change, it's the top three of those that we have seen the most in recent years. Uh, in particular, in 2016, 2017 and 2020, we saw three mass coral bleaching events. In 2016, the severe impacts were very much concentrated in the far north. In 2017, in the centre, and in 2020, uh, much more widespread, but severely impacted reefs very much interspersed with other reefs where there was little or no impact. But now I think we can clearly see that just in the space of five years, we've had three severe mass bleaching events and they have affected to varying degrees pretty much every corner of the enormous Great Barrier Reef system. So not surprisingly, uh, Gabrumpa has been very clear that climate change is the single most pressing issue in terms of the future health of the reef. Uh, we have a position statement on the subject that clearly states that climate change is the greatest threat to the Great Barrier Reef and only the strongest and fastest possible actions to decrease global greenhouse gas emissions will reduce the risks and limit the impacts of climate change on the reef. And when we look at the scientific advice about the relative impacts of one and a half degrees or two, and we realize that we are already at plus about 1.1 and under current greenhouse gas emissions trajectories, we are heading for three degrees or more by the end of the century, we realize how pressing this problem is. So if we look at the condition of the Great Barrier Reef, and this could be anything, but, but let's say that it's coral cover, uh, there's, there's two futures ahead of us. Uh, we know that future decline, um, at least at times, is inevitable given where we are heading with climate change. But obviously what we are all working in partnership to achieve is the upper of those trajectories. In other words, the condition of the reef stabilizes and over the longer term improves. And we're trying to avoid the lower of those trajectories where we hit some sort of tipping point or ecological threshold and the reef stays in a degraded condition over a long period of time. Now, just to be clear, if we think about some inshore reefs that have been the subject of severe water quality degradation since European settlement, we already have some reefs that have shown uh, a phase shift away from coral dominated systems to uh, more seaweed dominated systems. So this isn't just theory, we've seen this happen in some places on the Great Barrier Reef. And obviously we want to ensure that it doesn't happen to any more places than it already has. So back to the future um, and the choices that face us now, clearly whether we get the top or bottom of those trajectories is all about whether or not, um, or, or how much and how fast we continue to change the climate, but equally it is about that resilience threshold and what we do to support the resilience of the system locally. This means, for example, protecting our biodiversity through our zoning plan, ensuring that we improve water quality by working with farmers, um, getting the coastal development and the impact that has on the coastal ecosystems of the reef under control, making sure that our fishing is sustainable, but also increasingly today, making sure that we have effective targeted culling of crown of thorn starfish. And just to really emphasize the, the climate change piece of this puzzle and the supporting resilience piece are not alternatives. We have to do both and we have to do them both well and strongly and quickly. So, Essentially boiling those down, what this means is strong and effective implementation of the Paris Agreement and strong and effective implementation of the Reef 2050 plan. 
the Reef 2050 plan is a, is a pretty significant body of work bringing together all of the relevant government, industry and community work to protect the reef. Uh, the current version of it is based around seven themes, which are pretty comprehensive. And although the plan is currently under review at the moment and a new one will be out fairly soon, it's safe to say that this is the most comprehensive effort ever to bring together all of the elements of local activity to protect the reef and give it as much resilience as possible to climate change. There are three really significant foundational programs that sit within the Reef 2050 plan. So first of all, there is the work to improve water quality through the Reef 2050 Water Quality Improvement Plan. There is the Queensland Sustainable Fisheries Strategy, which again is extremely important that it is implemented fully and well. And then the third and final foundational program is the zoning of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Now, after we had the second of our three major mass bleaching events. In 2017, the Gabrumpa held a resilience forum. Um, and the consequence of that was actually, in a way, a lot more optimism than, than I thought would come out of it. But the mood in the room was, together we can secure the future of the Great Barrier Reef, but we need to try harder, do more, and act now. And so building on those foundational elements that I spoke of a moment ago. There was a push for enhanced compliance, which we are achieving through expanding the joint reef field management program. Uh, an all out assault on Crown of Thorns starfish, and obviously that's what we're here to talk about over the next couple of days. The protection of keystone species on reefs and facilitating restoration and obviously the development and now implementation of the reef restoration and adaptation program also with reef trust partnership funding is an extremely important part of that. And then the key that brings them all together is the building of a resilience network. Sheridan spoke of the fact that we don't have the resources to equally protect every one of 3000 coral reefs. And so the development and implementation of a resilience network that allows us to focus on the most ecologically and economically important reefs is critical for delivering the best return on investment possible from the resources that we have across those four uh, in park areas of management. So just to start speaking specifically about Crown of Thorns starfish now and where that fits into the puzzle. Clearly, not all reefs on the Great Barrier Reef are outbreaking simultaneously. We have a very clear initiation area between Cairns and Lizard Island, and those outbreaks then spread southwards. And this is clearly illustrated in this animation from the Ames Long Term Monitoring Program. That monitoring program goes back to the mid 1980s. So we can look at the percentage of reefs surveyed that are outbreaking, which is the top figure. We can look at the density of crown of thorn starfish, which is the bottom. And we can clearly see the coming and going of these three series of outbreaks that we have had. Uh, the current outbreak started in about 2011. And I think it's worth noting that the percentage of reefs uh, outbreaking spiked very quickly, but the density of crown of thorns did not spike anywhere near as quickly, unlike the previous two sets of outbreaks. And I know that Mike Emsley will be speaking to us tomorrow uh, more about the data from the long-term monitoring program and what we can learn from it. So again, using long-term monitoring program information, and I know that this analysis is a bit old now coming from 2012. And so those percentage figures of sources of coral mortality would likely now be quite different if we 
ran that analysis again, particularly the coral bleaching percentage. But the end conclusion is still the same, and Sheridan mentioned this, that we cannot control two of the major causes of coral mortality other than by global action on climate change, cyclones and coral bleaching. And that leaves us with the crown of thorn starfish as the only significant source of coral mortality on the reef that is amenable to significant intervention at a local management scale. And so even in this paper from 2012, there was um, a, put forward a strong case for direct action to reduce crown of thorn starfish populations to improve coral cover trajectories. I, I really want to uh, emphasize something that Teresa said, which is that in the reef space, we often don't celebrate progress and successes enough. And I think even just looking at the history of the current series of outbreaks going back to 2010 or 2011, if we look at the development of partnerships, of scientific innovation, of new partners coming into the fold to try and build a collaborative approach to this, it has actually been an amazing journey. And I'm not in any way suggesting that we don't still have challenges, but I think sometimes it is very much worth looking at the history of how we are dealing with an issue on the reef and celebrating our successes, because in this instance, there certainly have been some amazing successes. Of course, those successes have also been punctuated by a whole series of severe tropical cyclones and marine heat waves. And so climate change remains uh, a challenge that we have to overcome as we go through the process of improving crown of thorn starfish control. And equally, we've made pretty strong management progress. The blueprint that I spoke about, the original Reef 2050 plan, in 2015, the expansion of the Reef Joint Field Management Program, the advent of Reef Trust Partnership funding into the Crown of Thorn Starfish and the broader reef space. So I'm going to say it one more time. Let's celebrate our successes as well as acknowledge the challenges that we face. So I'm moving towards wrapping this up. And I just want to emphasize again that the things I've spoken about are not independent of each other. Uh, and I see the various strategies that we need to employ to protect the reef as being nested in a pyramid, not that the things at the top are the most important, but that each layer is dependent upon the layer before. So critically for our local management efforts to work, global action on climate change is absolutely essential. Continuing and improving our traditional foundational management on the land, in our fisheries, in our marine parks is absolutely essential. And then the ongoing improvement and development of the new and emerging strategies that came out of the blueprint and previously restoration, crown of thorn starfish control, protection of keystone species, but held together by a resilience network that lets us know that we are delivering the best ecological outcome for the resources that we have to invest. The last thing that I'd like to say is undoubtedly the reef is experiencing severe pressures. And as the people who are working together to protect it, we are facing some pretty extreme challenges. But I urge everybody to not lose sight of the fact that the reef remains part of the Australian national identity. It is the critical spiritual home of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It is an incredible global environmental icon recognized at the very least through being a world heritage area and one of the seven wonders of the world. Of course, we are experiencing severe challenges with COVID, but nonetheless, the reef remains an economic powerhouse for Queensland and Australia's economies. 
and of course it is the home and the birthplace of nemo and his friends. and let's not forget that that's the most important thing for every eight year old in the world so many thanks for your time this morning i'm sorry that i couldn't be there i hope the uh the forum is a productive one and i hope everybody stays safe given the things that are happening at the moment and uh thanks very much for your time